different from title launched. But, uh, it's the same material. I just uh, forgot what title I gave. Okay, okay so uh, um, let's start the uh, motivation or the problem. Okay. Uh, suppose F, G, H are all graphs. We write this F, L, G, H means the following. You color the edges of F, color the edges of F by two colors. No matter how you color it, either you find a copy of G in red or you find a copy of H in blue. Okay. This is not induced subgraph, just a subgraph. A subgraph, which is a red copy of G or red blue copy of H. This is the meaning of this. And for example, we have um, we have K six implies this L. I already did this L. K six L K three K three. This means that if you uh, color the edges of K six by two colors, red and blue, there's either red K three or blue K three. Okay. This one is contained in um, many <laughs> textbooks. And uh, another way to say it is that among any six people, there are either three people that know each other or three people they don't know each other. Right? I guess, uh, I suppose many people, you, you, or maybe all of you know this result, right? That how to, how to prove it even. It's easy proof. Okay, so the Ramsey theorem says that for any GNH, you can find one F, such that this is true. Okay? And if you can find an F, then you can find many F, because you add an edges, add vertices, it's still true. And in particular, you can find a, a KN, because there's an H missing, you can put that H there. So it will not still have the same property. Okay. So the, the Ramsey number is the smallest N, such that KN L G H, the Ram's number of this. We write out L G for this notation. And in particular, our K is the Ram's number of K K. And our K L is the Ram's number of K K and K L. And this is the uh, this is the classical Ram's number which has been studied uh, very extensively and uh, but we do not know that much about these numbers. So this is uh, table about small Ramsey numbers. For example, you look at a diagonal, we know this, K33, that's 6, that I just mentioned. We know K44, but we do not know K5. Okay. For K5, it's still, there's only an upper bound and lower bound, and later on, the gap is getting bigger and bigger. Okay. And now, uh, this is the definition of the Ramsey number. Ramsey number, okay? I am going to revise this definition. I'll leave it just like I did yesterday about the chromatic, about the... Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting to look at one definition from different point of view, then you find different ways of generalizing it. So this, the Ramsey number is the same as to say that you find in a graph which L, G, and H, you want to minimize the number of vertices here. If you want, if you find a minimi, you find a such a graph, well, this graph should be a KN, right, with the complete graph, because minimize the vertices, you can put edges there if there's an edge missing, okay? Now, by looking at this way, then this Ramsey number is minimize among those F, among those F, which L, G, H, you minimize this number of vertices. Now, number of vertices is just the one parameter of this graph, one graph parameter. You can minimize other graph parameters. So, for example, you can minimize the number of edges. Why number of vertices? You can minimize the number of edges. That is called the size Ramsey number. Okay. This is a study. And you can minimize the maximum degree of this graph. Okay. That's called the maximum degree Ramsey number. And you can minimize the chromatic number of such a graph. Okay. So any parameter you can have this, this uh, 
uh, corresponding Ramsey number. Okay. So this is the chromatic Ramsey number. This is one of the concepts that mentioned in my title. Okay. So, uh, for example, the number of vertices. So any graph on this, more vertices than that. So the uh -huh. so among there are many there are many graphs f that satisfies this, right? Among them, you choose one with minimum number of vertices, and that minimum number of vertices is going to be the Ramsey number. There are many. That does not mean if you have more vertices, you are going to imply the L. But uh, I'm choosing among those that have this property. I look at those. They, they have the minimum number of vertices. So among the minimum, yeah, among the minimum ones, complete graph is there. Right. So that, 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 therefore, this is the same as this. Yeah. Okay. So you can minimize, this is a minimized number, but you can minimize any graph parameter, then you get many different uh, Ramsey numbers, and this is the uh, this is the one I'm going to talk about. So I put it uh, here. <laughs> okay. So, what is the relation between the chromatic Ramsey number and the other Ramsey numbers? Well, if Okay, this is, this is a simplified in notations for if both are the same. And this parameter was introduced by Bell, Aldrich, and Novash in 1976. It follows from the definition immediately that the chromatic Ramsey number is bounded by the Ramsey number. Right? Because you, you choose all those f, among all those f, choose the minimum chromatic number. Of course, the kn is one of the, in that, and the chromatic number is n. And the, uh, if, if, the graph, if the two graphs are complete graphs, then this equality holds. Okay? Because if, you, if, you, uh, if your f is not complete, then it does not help you because I can color it by, by the color and then color the edges by the <coughs> different uh, color class, so the edges between color class 1 and color class 2 will be color the same color because you want, a you want a monochromatic copy of complete graph, you can only pick one vertex from each color class right? so you have a big color class that's not going to help you okay? so therefore this, this is going to be to, to find the F, L, K, N, K, 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 N, K, L, you you better only look at the complete graphs, among complete graphs. So therefore, the chromatic number is the same as the, the chromatic Ramsey number is the same as the Ramsey number. And therefore, this chromatic Ramsey number is also very difficult, as the Ramsey number is difficult. Okay, so the questions we are interested in is if we know the chromatic number of G, what can we say? about the chromatic Ramsey number of G. Okay? That is the question we are interested. If we know the chromatic number of G, what can we say about the chromatic Ramsey number? Is there a relation between these two? Okay, if G has chromatic number, if F, if F has chromatic number M minus one square, then I can 2H color this F in such a way that the monochromatic subgraph has uh, chromatic number m minus 1. This is how I call it. So this is the case n equals 4. So I have the f as chromatic number 3 square. So I put 3 color. So this is my, these are the, my color classes. I put the color classes in a square, in a 3 by 3 square. Okay. Then I color all these horizontal edges by one color, so the edges between these two, edges between these two, edges between these two, I call it horizontal edges. I color it by one color, and this is one color, 
it's, it's the same color, the same color, same color, same color, and the, the remaining edges in another color. So you look at the subgraph of this yellow color, it is n minus one colorable. Right? This is it, you already have a n minus one coloring here. And you look at the red subgraph, it's also n minus one colorable. So both red graph and the blue and the yellow graphs are n minus one colorable. This means what? This means that if your graph has chromatic number n, F will not L G, right? Because I two color the edges of F. I cannot find the monochromatic copy of G because G has chromatic number n. My monochromatic graphs have chromatic number n minus one. I cannot find G there. So the conclusion is that if the chromatic number of G is n, then the chromatic Ramsey number is at least n minus one squared plus one. Okay? It's at least this is no bound. And of course, it can be much larger than this. So this is just an all bound. Given the G, it can, in particular, if this G is KN, is the complete graph, then this is Ramsey number, right? We know, we do not know the exact number, we do not know exact value of the Ramsey number, but we know it is exponential, right? So therefore, it's much larger than this one. However, Bell Eldish Novash conjectured the following. So for any n, they conjectured that for any n, there is one graph, the chromatic number is n, and the chromatic Ramsey number is n minus one squared plus one. So that means this bound is sharp. Okay? This null bound is sharp. You cannot increase the null bound anymore. It's best the null bound in general. Okay. Okay, so they proposed this conjecture and they proved this conjecture for the case n equals 3 and n equals 4. So they find a 3 chromatic graph whose chromatic Ramsey number is, <coughs> five, is 5. They find a 4 chromatic graph, the chromatic Ramsey number is 10. Okay. And I proved it for n equals 5. So I find the 5 chromatic graph, this chromatic Ramsey number is 17. <coughs> so uh, what I'm going to show you now is that I show this conjecture is true in general. Okay. So uh, to prove that this conjecture, we use a lemma, which is used in the first paper by, uh, by these three authors the, when they introduced this parameter. So the lemma says that uh, the chromatic Ramsey number is less or equal to n if and only if k l's home g. What does that mean? This means that for any 2h coloring of this k n, there is a monochromatic graph which is a homomorphic image of G. Okay, hom G is a family of graphs. It, they are the homomorphic image of G. So no matter how you color the edges of Kn, you will find monochromatic subgraph which is a homomorphic image of G. So G admits homomorphism to this monochromatic graph. The, the yeah, the okay, so the <coughs> definition, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what is a homomorphism? A homomorphism is an age-preserving vertex mapping, okay. So you, for example, you send, you send all these three vertices to this vertex, all these three vertices to this vertex, this one to this one, this one to this one, this two to this one, then this map preserve the edges, which means that whenever two vertices are adjacent here, you look at the, you look their image, they are adjacent. Okay. So this is a homomorphism. Okay. Homomorphism means 
vertex mapping which preserves the edges. And this is called a homomorphic image of this graph. Okay. This is a homomorphic image of this graph. So in the previous statement says that if you, you two color the edges of Kn, you will find a copy, a monochromatic copy, which is a homomorphic image of H uh, of G. So you may not find a monochromatic copy of G, but you find a monochromatic copy of the image. Say so you find H, maybe you may find H there, or some other homomorphic image. There's, there are many homomorphic images. Okay. In particular, G itself is a homomorphic image. Okay, okay so uh, this lemma is actually quite easy to prove. I will show you uh, the proof. So, suppose, suppose one direction. The other direction is also easy. I just show you one direction. Suppose Kn L homo G. That means no matter how you two edge color Kn, you will find a monochromatic copy which is a homomorphic image of G. Suppose this is true. I want to show that the chromatic Ramsey number of G is at most N. That means I can find an N chromatic graph that LG. Okay. So what does that how how do I do that? I take I take an N chromatic graph so I want to find the n chromatic graph, that LG. So what I do, I take a complete n partite graph, that is n chromatic. This complete n partite is huge. That means each partite set is huge. It's huge, but it's still n chromatic. And then you two, no matter how you you take an arbitrary two edge coloring of this F. Now, after your coloring, it's a two-edge coloring, by using pigeonhole principle, I can find that you can find a, a small set, it's small, but it's large, it's still large. Small means compared to this one, it's small, but it's still large enough for my, if I, for my um, later use. So I can find a small set here, a small set here, a small set here, so that you look at the edges between them, they're all the same color. Okay? You think for a little while, you can prove this by pigeonhole principle, and this is the same color, but this color and this color has nothing to do. They may be the same, may be different, and this is the same color. Okay. Okay. So, edges between two color classes they are the same color. I can find such a thing. So this is indeed a two-edged coloring of the complete graph Kn. Right? It is, it's a blue up. It's a blue up of a two-edged coloring of the complete graph. By, by our assumption, in this two-edged coloring of this Kn, I find a monochromatic subgraph which is a homomorphic image of G. Okay? So this defines a two edge current. There's a there's a homomorphic image. So there's a homomorphic image means that I have I, for example this is my G, I find the monochromatic image here. And the image now on this side is this is not a single graph, it's a complete bipartite graph here. And this is a complete bipartite graph here. Right? Now I, sh I make sure that this part is big enough. It's small, but big enough. Small is compared to the huge. Right? So then I can pull it back to get a monochromatic copy of G there. Right? So this is how you prove this lemma. Okay, now... Now... Uh, uh, so, we use this lemma to prove that prove this conjecture. How do we, uh, if we want to prove this conjecture by using that lemma, what we can, what we need to do? We need to find n chromatic graph. We need to construct n chromatic graph G, so that the following is true. 
for any two edge current of this graph you will find a monochromatic subgraph which is a homomorphic image of this gene okay. because this says that by that number this says that the chromatic Ramsey number of G is at most this number so this is what we need to do okay so the I need to construct this graph okay the construction <coughs> is easy construction is easy how do I construct it I take all the two H colorings of this complete graph this is a fixed complete graph there are many different ways of two H color this graph but it's finite I take all these two H colorings okay. there, this are the list of all the two H coloring of this graph for each two H coloring of this graph if you two H color this graph you look at the monochromatic subgraphs so you color it in red and blue you look at the red graph you look at the blue graph one of them has chromatic number at least n you cannot have both graphs at chromatic number n minus one if both graphs are n minus one colorable you take the coordinate you take the, the product of this color you will get n minus one square coloring of the original graph right suppose your blue graph has n minus one coloring and your red graph has n minus one coloring now for each vertex I take the color in the red graph and the color in the blue graph as a vector this vector as a color of this graph it will give me a proper coloring of the original graph okay. so at least one of the graph is m as chromatic number at least n I take that graph that graph I call it GI so look at the CI I look, I've got the graph GI so I got I got uh, G1, G2 and a GM and I take the product of these graphs that's my graph G okay. that's my graph G and this product means this product if you have an H in G and an H in H then there's a cross in the G and H okay. so there's no other edges so for this product this is called uh, there are different names for this product it's called the director product or categorical product or weak product there are many different names but I just show you the definition so if both coordinates are adjacent then these two vertices are adjacent so for this product one property is that the projection is a homomorphism the projection preserve the edges right. so you take the product then each GI is a homomorphic image of G because you just take the projection so each GI is a homomorphic image of G therefore I have this property for any two AG coloring of K M minus one square plus one there's a monochromatic subgraph which is a homomorphic image of G because there's a monochromatic which is GI which is a homomorphic image of G so this part is proved okay. I have this graph and have this property and what I need to do is that to show that this is enchromatic okay. what we know is that each GI is at least enchromatic each of this factor graph is at least enchromatic and I don't know if G is enchromatic well there's no example showing that G is not enchromatic okay. so but there's uh, there's a famous conjecture no? it's a head Niemi conjecture which is says the this is true the chromatic of the product is the minimum of the two graphs chromatic of these two graphs if this conjecture is true if this is true then this is true right? and then we are done 
But we don't know if this conjecture is true. Okay. It has been open for, say, uh, uh, 45 years now. No. And um, uh, we know very little about this graph. And so, um, uh, in 2002, I have, I have a paper which I talk about the fractional version of head Niami conjecture. I look at the fractional chromatic number of, of these graphs, and they are the product of graphs, and uh, uh, I made this conjecture. So, this is a fractional version of head Niami conjecture. Okay, maybe I will, I will define the Hadniami conjecture, uh, the, the fractional chromatic number on the blackboard. So, what is, uh, what is the chromatic number? What is the chromatic number? What is the coloring of the graph? To color this graph, I look at the independent sets. This is the family of all independent sets of the graph. Okay? So, this is all the independent sets. I want to choose some independent sets as color classes. So a choose is a function. Let's call it phi. It's a function that goes to 0 and 1. So I choose it or not choose it. So after I choose this, the family of independent sets, I want each vertex to be in one of these sets. So that means if you look at for each vertex, for each vertex, and if you look at those independent sets which contains this vertex, and this should be one. There's one exactly one of the independent sets containing this in containing this vertex is chosen. Okay. And so this means I have find the coloring of this graph. If I want to find define the chromatic number then I minimize the total number of independent sets. Minimize this. I minimize this number. This is the number of independent sets I have chosen. If I minimize this summation, then I'm looking for the chromatic number of the graph. And for fractional coloring, fractional coloring is just uh, instead of choose or the independent set, I can choose this independent set fractionally. I choose half of the independent sets, or some, some, in some sense. And the, the, other, the others are the same. The other requirements are the same. Then the, minimize, the, then the minimum is the fractional chromatic number of G. It's a fractional chromatic number. Okay. Okay. So, uh, in 2002, I wrote a paper about it and verified this conjecture for some cases, but uh, uh, the ref the referee said that uh, you had you, as a conjecture, your support is not strong. So he suggested me to change it to a question. So I followed his suggestion and changed it to a question. I asked this question, is it true? And uh, uh, now the observation of Claude Talif is that if the fractional head dynamic conjecture is true, then bell eldish novash conjecture is also true. Why is that? Well, this is the original proof before this. We have seen this this transparency before. So we can find the GI which has chromatic number at least n okay, for any two edge coloring. But it's easy to say that this is basically the same argument. You can choose one which is the fractional chromatic number is greater than n minus one. The fractional the fractional chromatic cannot be both b and minus one. That's impossible. About the same argument. Okay. And it's even okay, then if the if the fraction had Niemi conjecture is true, 
I have to have the fractional chromatic number of this product is greater than n minus 1. Because the fractional chromatic number of the product equals the minimum of the factors. Each of them is greater than n minus 1, so the fractional of the whole graph is, of the product graph is greater than n minus 1. And the chromatic number is greater or equal to the fractional chromatic number, and it's an integer. So therefore, it's at least n, and I have this conclusion also. Okay. So, it remains to prove this conjecture. Okay. So, to prove this conjecture. And that's what... Uh, so, there's, uh, in the last year, there's a professor in our university, Zhejiang Normal University, he proved the... Uh, he, he, he was working on the uh, independence number of the product of vertex transitive graphs. And his results I uh, interpreted as a proof of this, uh, of this conjecture for this vertex transitive graphs. He didn't write his result in this way, but it's basically this result. He's counting the number of vertices in the maximum independence set of the product graph. Okay. But for vertex transitive graphs, the <coughs> maximum independence set and the fractional chromatic number has a, has a very nice formula. It's basically equivalent in some sense. And now what I, what I did is to, to, uh, to say uh, it is true for every, every graph. Okay, so the fractional chromatic number of a graph, the fractional chromatic number of graph is defined this way. This, this is the definition of fractional chromatic number, and that's another way to write it. It's a, it's a linear programming problem. Okay? It's a linear programming problem. You look at the dual problem, the dual linear problem of this problem is called the fractional clique number of the graph. It defines the fractional clique number of graph. What is the fractional clique number of a graph? So the fractional clique number, did I define it? Maybe I define. Okay, it's a dual problem. Maybe I, I define it here. So you, you find a fractional clique A fractional clique is a mapping from the vertices to 0 and the 1, such that for every independent set, for every independent set, you take the summation of those vertices in this independent set, is less or equal to 1. And this is called a fractional clique. And you want to maximize this, this summation of all the... You can think of each vertex as a weight. And you want to maximize the total weight subject to this condition. You look at this. Suppose, suppose this is a fractional clique. Suppose this is not an interval. Instead of interval, if you have 0 and 1, that is a choice function again. You choose some vertices, right? So if this is 0 and 1, then this is a choice function. You choose some vertices. Okay? If it's 0, it's not chosen. If 1 is chosen. Okay? What does this mean? This means if the chosen vertices are pairwise adjacent, uh, you cannot choose two vertices that are not adjacent. If not adjacent, then it's an independent set. The summation should be at most one. So you can choose at most one of them if the, if the two vertices are not adjacent. So therefore, if this, this would define the clique number, define the maximum clique. Okay? So this is why it's called a fractional clique. Instead of this one, you take this. This is called a fractional clique. Okay. By the uh, uh, duality of the linear problem, we know that this uh, fractional chromatic number is always equal to the fractional clique number for any graph. So, this, this is the uh, theorem. 
I will want to prove this one, and this is the same as this, right? Because fractional clique is the same as fractional Kramark number. So the proof sketch. This is what we want to prove, and this is trivial. This part is trivial. Uh, this this is um, uh, this is basically um, uh, you you take the coordinate coloring, you get the fractional coloring of the of the uh, the product graph, and the difficult part is to prove this one. So this is this is easy, okay? This is easy, and this is difficult. And to prove this one, I choose to prove this one. This change of change the fractional Cramach number to fractional clique number. The advantage is that for to prove this one, I just need to show the existence of fractional clique, which is as big as this one. And this to prove this is one is to prove that you cannot find the fractional coloring smaller than this. So one is existence of something, and the other is non-existence of something, which seems more difficult to prove. Okay. So it suffices to construct a fractional clique. Oh, sorry. It substitutes a fractional clique of the product, so the total weight is this much. I just need to construct a fractional clique. And it turns out the construction is easy, the construction of fraction clique is easy. So I have a fraction. I know, I, I know what is the fractional clique number of this graph, and I know what is this. So I have a fraction, maximum fractional clique of G, and the fractional, maximum fractional clique of H. These are given. Okay. Then what is my fractional clique of the product graph, which is just defined by this simple formula? It's a very natural definition. <coughs> and uh, I want to show that this is a fractional clique of the product graph with total weight minimum of these two. If I can prove this, then I'm done. Okay. And uh, this part is easy. You just calculate the total weight. You just take the summation. That's, that's just a very trivial one. And what you need to do is to prove this is a fractional clique. This is difficult. What do you mean by proving this is a fractional clique? Well, that is to prove it satisfies this condition. Okay. That is to prove that for any independent set in the product, the summation uh, the, this summation is less or equal to this one. It's actually this, this summation is less or equal to one. I, I put it on the other side, so this is this summation is less or equal to this num, to this maximum. So that is what we need to prove. Okay, we need to prove you look at any independent set of this product, and you look at this weight. This g is a fractional clique of g, and h is a fractional clique of h. And you look at this, it's going to be less or equal to the fraction maximum of these two. And uh, by symmetry, we may assume that this, uh, this larger one is uh, this G. Fraction of clique number of G is the big one. And then you look at this graph. This is the product. This is X, this is Y, and this is XY. And the weight, I put the weight there, and GX times HY. And I want to prove the summation of this total weight is going of, of any pro, of any independent set is going to be less or equal to the maximum of the of the two. I, I call this is the weight of the the weight of this vertex of x y. Okay. So I want to prove this. This is what I want to prove. Okay. For any independent set of this product graph, the total weight of the independent is less or equal to this. So this is, by assumption, this is equal to the weight of fractional clique of, uh, of G, because this is not, not your one. OK, so um, this is the product. If there's an edge on the top, there's an edge on the, uh, on the horizontal edge, there's vertical edge, you put, an edge, put, to cross, put a cross there. 
So you look at, uh, look at some special independent sets. So if this is an independent set of H, okay, you look at the, the, uh, the columns that form an independent set of the whole graph, of the product graph. Okay. Now if the independent set has weight alpha, if this independent set of H has weight alpha, and you look at this one, this is going to be alpha times the, you just calculate is simply to calculate this. This is going to be alpha times omega g. So if alpha is less or equal to one, this, the, the, this of course alpha is less or equal to one because that's a fraction of clique. And similarly, if the horizontally, this is true. This kind of this kind of independent set is easily seen to be true. What is difficult is you have independent set look like this. What are you going to do? Okay. Okay, so for this kind of independent set, what, I, what I'm going to do, uh, I define, okay, I, I partition this independent set into two parts, two sets. U, U, U is going to be partitioned A union B. What is B? B is those, those points such that you look... Um, You look vertically, you look vertically, you'll find x prime, and uh, there's an h between x and x prime, and this vertex is in, this is in this set. So for those x, y, I put it into b. Okay, so if you look vertically and find something where there's an h, there's a vertical h there. Of course, there's, an age, there's no edge between these two. Okay. Because for an edge to be in the product, you have to both coordinate have edges. Okay. okay, suppose these are the vertices in B. These are the vertices in B. And the other vertices are in A. A is the, uh, uh, the remaining part, it's a partition. So I partition the vertices into A and the partition vertices A union B. And for each Y, for each Y, A Y is just uh, the, uh, the X that's X Y in A. So A Y is just uh, look at this, okay? Just look at the coordinates. You fix Y, you look at the, this coordinates. And uh, you, you, you can, s by this definition, each AY is independent. Otherwise, it should be in B, right? So each AY is independent. And then, so this is independent set. This is a, if you, of course, it's independent set in the product. I mean, an independent set in G, okay? This is going to be independent set in G, okay? And then you look at BY, <coughs> BX, for B, I look horizontally, okay? and you can prove that this is going to be independent set in H. Okay. So um, uh, this is a proof. So if if this is uh, is this a proof? Okay. Anyway, so it, it, either this is a proof or believe me, <laughs> there's a proof. Okay. Then. Uh, there's, uh, I'm going to use the foreign lemma. Okay, so, so I'm going to use the lemma I haven't proved yet. So, okay. So, I'm going to take the summation, right? This is what I'm trying to do. This is an independent set. I'm going to take the summation. I'm going to take the summation. The summation now is partitioned in two parts because my U is partitioned in A and B. And for A, for A, I take... Uh, I first, I first uh, uh, summation uh, horizontal, the vertically, and then take take the summation of it because it's split it the, in the in columns, right? I first take summation of each column, and the, and then and for this for this one, I take the ro summation when it rows, and then take summation again. So this is what it means. Now. There's a lemma which says, uh, suppose this is an independent, this is an independent, this is a y, is an independent set, and you took the labor hood in G, 
So Ay is the independent set of G, and you take the neighborhood, a uh, closed neighborhood of this independent set. So this is the closed neighborhood, and you compare the weight, weight of G Ay and the weight of the neighborhood, closed neighborhood. There's a relation between them. So the closed neighborhood, the weight is bigger, right, because it's more. But the weight cannot be much bigger, so the weight is bounded. So the, the okay, so, uh, sorry, so the, the um, okay, anyway, so what I said is wrong. So this, this what is written here is correct. Okay. So this is, there's a relation between these two. Okay. And uh, uh, there's a proof, uh, then I'm going to skip the proof. You have to believe me, okay? So just believe me. Then, okay, then I replace this. So this, look at this summation. I replace this one by this close neighborhood. Okay? Because using that, the, the lemma before, I can replace it, but I have to put one of uh, the the click fraction the click number this this together gives the, the by using that inequality i have nestle equal to, this is le, this part this nestle equal to this part okay by using that number and this part is this by similarly this part is nestle equal to this part okay. and uh, uh uh so uh i know that this uh so this Remember, this is assumed to be bigger, so I replace this by smaller one. It's even bigger. Okay, so that's so it becomes the summation of this of these two. And now, so I look at this uh, horizontal independent set and the vertical independent set. I, I took so this is a y, this is b x, and I take the closed neighborhood and they take the close, this is the close neighborhood, and this is the close neighborhood, only one, the, the close neighborhood is horizontal close neighborhood, and this is uh, vertical close neighborhood, and for each of them I do this, for each of them I take the close neighborhood, I take this close neighborhood, and for each horizontal one I take the close neighborhood, for each vertical one I take the close neighborhood. Okay. Then another lemma says the yellow area and the blue area do not intersect. Okay. Why is that? Let us uh, just prove one case. Suppose they do intersect okay, like this. So there's one point here which is contained in the blue area, also in the, red, in the yellow area. Okay. What does this mean? Because I'm taking the close neighborhood of this part, so that means, that means, uh, okay, I'm taking, the, I'm taking the close neighborhood of this part, that means there's one vertex which is adjacent to this one. There's an edge, there's an edge here somewhere. And this one, there's an edge somewhere here. But then there should be an edge crossing. That contradicting your assumption the original set is independent. So there are other cases, there are other cases, but I'm going to skip it. So you have to believe me again. So now we came back to this summation. So this is this is uh, equal to this. This is yellow area. This is a blue area. But the yellow and the blue do not intersect. So therefore, it's less or equal to the summation of the total. And this total is just the product. And this product is. So therefore, it is fraction of click number of G. That's it. <laughs> that means thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.